Assalamualaikum dan selamat sejahtera kepada semua So today we're going to learn on this new chapter which is pediatric nutrition So we're going to learn on the what are the foods needed once a baby has been delivered Alright, so first of all must we need to know what is their age So this is uh, particularly focusing on the infant nutrition So when we say infant, what is the age of an infant? An infant is categorized as those with um one month to two years of age this is according to the fda and also from who is those that is less than one year while uh, british national formulary says that those who are infant is from one to one month from from one month to one year old right we're going to the next slide so the basis for feeding recommendation is based on growth, based on your physiology, infant development and also their nutrient requirements. So these are the important nutrients for infants. So this is basically the same as that you have learned in princip principle of human nutrition. The baby, the infants need protein, of course, for their development, growth development, they need iron to carry the oxygen. They also need zinc for the baby's growth. Calcium, very important for their to make their strong bones and teeth. And also vitamin A, vitamin A for their uh, vision and strengthen the immune system. And also vitamin C as they need either for growth, healing and protection for infection and also folate to make DNA, RNA, RNA and these are all the genetic materials, right? And the growth in infants, they grow very fast, right? In this period of time. So the, the weight increases up to 200%. Body length increases like uh, 55%. Head circumference increases 40%. And their brain weight doubles. So these are the rapid body growth that happen during the first, I think the first uh, one year uh, during the infant, right? And what are the feeding that we have to give to the newborn? Of course, the breast milk. Okay, so this is suggested by all the health authorities here to exclusive breastfeed the child up to six months. And when it um the further the further after six months is complementary feeding, we call it, which is giving solid food. We introduce solid food as well as the baby's um I mean the hum I mean the mother's milk, right? And also the if we can't go for the breastfeeding, we go for the formula feeding, right? And these are all the benefits of breastfeeding to the infants, all right? Of course, the immunologic benefits of the immunologic benefits that have in the cholesterol and also in the mature milk after later after that, you still have some uh, antibodies to protect the baby, and all of these are the advantages of breastfeeding. And these are the advantages to the mother. If the mother give breastfeed, if the mother breastfeed their child, what would happen? As I mentioned before, to delay the ovulation, to loss of pregnancy associated adipose tissue and weight gain, to suppress postpartum building, bleeding, sorry, and also to decrease breast cancer rate. And these are several reasons why a mother may not breastfeed her baby because of certain medical or health reason. Okay, later we are going to touch on this part. And then those baby with special requirements, maybe the baby have lactose intolerance and some social or psychological reasons that they have to take certain medications. So some of the medications are not allowed to breastfeed and other reason working mother. So this is one of the, these are several reasons why a mother does not breastfeed her baby. And when we mentioned that mothers have some medical health problem, so those mothers who have HIV, right, or untreated active pulmonary tuberculosis, which is TB, they are contraindicated to give breast milk in US, in United States. But in some countries, if I'm not mistaken again, in Africa or India, they are still allowed to give breast milk because the breast milk oversuppress the um the um the 
the uh, disadvantages of not giving breast milk. So they said that if the, the mothers can still continue to give breast milk, even though they have this kind of HIV, all right? So certain mothers in, um, I mean, in uh, low-income countries, they can't afford to buy those, uh, you know, those expensive formula milk. Rather than not giving any milk, they can still give milk. Um, through their um through 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 their uh, breast milk right but um uh, but of course um if you are in a stable country you have a strong support system they do not allow you to give uh, breast milk even if you have if you happen to have HIV and also untreated TB and if those if the maternal have any infections they still can give um uh in a kalau mak tu tak ada all this infection if the mother doesn't have any hiv if the mother doesn't have any untreated tb they still can breastfeed even though they have uh, other infections all right hanya this two je yang tak dibenarkan untuk bagi breast milk right and then, so maternal who have hepatitis A, B, or C, they usually can just breast milk because it doesn't learn, it doesn't usually transmit through the breast milk. Okay, kalau mak tu ada hepatitis A, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, sekitar dia ramai masih boleh menyusu sebab susu tersebut um, tidak di are not affected by this. Uh, is it is not uh, transmitted this disease does not transmit into the breast milk. Okay, they are still allowed to give milk. And again, the infant must be immunized against hep hepatitis B. So a mother who develops a fever or other signs of mild non-life-threatening infection while breastfeeding, right? And already expose her infant to the and already expose her infant to the infection should be encouraged to continue breastfeeding. So teruskan sahaja penyesuaian. Alright, ataupun express breast milk, express mean uh, teruskan me, mengepam susu tersebut because the breast milk again have all these antibodies and other non-specific anti-infectious to protect the infant. So susu ibu ni sangat hebat, alright, sudah diciptakan oleh pencipta, sangat hebat yang mana boleh me melindungi baby tersebut daripada infection-infection ini. Jadi teruskan sahaja penyusuan even though the mother have fever or other signs of infection, right? Teruskan sahaja menyusu. In fact, uh, if the mother discontinue breastfeeding, it will increase the infant's risk of developing the infection. So, in fact, kalau ibu tu tak teruskan penyusuan terhadap baby tersebut, lagi tinggi risiko baby tersebut untuk kena infection rather than rather than ibu tersebut menyusu anaknya. Alright, mastitis does not harm the infant, and the continuation of breastfeeding is essential to hasten the mother's rec recovery. So even so, if the mother happen to have the mastitis, teruskan sahaja penyusuan sebab dia tidak akan um, efek kepada baby tersebut dan malah boleh mengurangkan sakit uh, ataupun malah membantu pemulihan semula mastitis. Alright. So breastfeeding may even be continued with breast abscesses as long as the incision and surgical drainage to are far or enough away from the areola that are not involved in the feeding. Uh, in the feeding again. So those yang ada mastitis, so yang ada breast, kalau kata tak sakit dan tak tak melalui surgical dan sebagainya masih boleh meneruskan penyusuan. Okay, as long as ada benda-benda yang jauh daripada tempat penyusuan itu. Breastfeeding mothers can take most drugs, whether prescription or over-the-counter, but um, reduce active isotopes and certain anti-metabolites anti -metabolites and anti, uh, few antibiotics and anti-psychotic drugs are contraindicated during breastfeeding. Tapi, these uh, drugs must be... Uh, must be um, if you if the mothers happen to take this drug, they must contraindicate it. Uh, they must um, they are not allowed to breastfeed their child during uh, taking these kind of drugs. Okay. And herbals are not recommended because they contain many active ingredients. So, sekiranya ibu bersalin, 
uh, ada setengah orang ada yang berpantang dengan makan jamu and some set of some certain of herbs so maybe you have to get advice from the doctor whether it's allowed or it is not allowed okay so because we are not we do not know the active ingredients that I have in the herbs so these are the absolute Absolute contraindications to breastfeeding. So ini adalah antara tiga benda yang memang tidak boleh menyusu susu ibu. Yang pertama hypergalactosemia. So the strongest contraindication is when the infant has an inherited metabolic disorder such as galactosemia, which he is unable to metabolize the lactose portion of milk sugar called galactose. Alright. So lactose elimination for the infant must be then implemented and the infant should not be breastfed. So ada condition di mana baby tersebut ada metabolic disorder yang diwarisi which is kita panggil sebagai galactosemia where the baby is unable to metabolize the galactose. So he cannot be breastfed because of this um, inherited metabolic disorder. And then those with uh, infants with phenylketonuria, right? So infants with phenylketonuria may continue to receive breast milk because of its low phenylalanine concentration if they are monitored carefully for blood phenylalanine levels. So baby yang ada phenylketonuria, dia masih boleh menyusu teruskan penyusuan dengan syarat dipantau dia punya level of phenylalanine, alright? So there are other inherited disorder that contraindicated or require modification of breastfeeding but they are rare. Jarang sangat. So ada lagi kes-kes lain tapi jarang sangat berlaku. So these are the medical contraindication to breastfeeding connected with mother. So mothers yang ada decompensated chronic disease like blood circulation is insufficiency, kidney or liver problems and psychologic disorder as epilepsy, schizophrenia, depressive psychosis, postpartum psychosis. So they they are not allowed to breastfeed because some of them have taken the and have taken the drugs related to the psychological disorder. So the drugs are really uh, really uh, can be easily transmitted to the breast milk. And then also substance abuse of drugs, alcohol, marijuana, cocaine and heroin. So these are the contraindication to breastfeed the babies. Right? So we have looked at through the contraindications of breastfeeding towards the mothers and infant. Now we're going to look at the infant formula because, there are, because due to this contraindication, that's why we have the infant formula for those mothers who can't breastfeed their infant there are there are other alternative which is the infant formula so the infant formula mimics the original composition of the human milk right so it is iron fortified copy the composition of the breast milk but it still do not have uh, antibodies protection and also it needs to prepare in a safe safe preparation to avoid food poisoning to avoid other related disease too um, hygienic food preparation right so if you see here this is the breast milk this is the infant formula and this is the cow's milk in terms of the composition the protein is six percent for breast milk nine percent for the infant formula and about 20 percent for the cow's milk so cow's milk is a no-no for those bb less than one year okay because of the high protein here while for the carbohydrate, sorry, for the fat, it is about 55% um, for, from uh, the composition for breast milk. Infant formula is about 49%, so a bit, uh, quite similar, right? And also 51% um, from the cow's milk. So if you, if you could recall the previous lecture, the composition of human milk, half of, half of the composition of milk comes from it consists of fat. Okay, if you still remember, fifty percent consists of milk. So this is the breast milk, right? Half of it is fat, and then about forty percent, be kurang lah, about forty percent 
is carbohydrate, which is the more dominant is lactose. And the rest is vitamins, protein, trace minerals, all right? So this is the breast milk composition. I think I've, I've told you this in the previous lecture, right? So we have the colostrum, guys. So the colostrum is the, the initial milk, susu yang mula-mula keluar, is high in protein and lower in fat. And um, let and lower in fat and lactose concentration. So it is high in protein, lower in fat and lactose concentration, but it's very high in the circuitry immunoglobin E as for protection for the baby to develop, to upper, to give um, protection to the baby, of course. So this is the cow's milk. Just now we we learn about the breast milk. Now we're looking at the cow cow's milk. Okay, so particularly for inf health risk, particularly for infant less than six months, so it can give risk to the health for an infant that is less than six months. It can cause intestinal bleeding. Okay, kecederaan pada in is intestine intestine usus because of the um. Uh, which may lead to iron deficiency. Once there's uh, intestinal bleeding, it may lead to iron deficiency. And then, of course, the cow's milk is a uh, poor source of poor source of iron, high in calcium and lower in vitamin C. So these two will further reduce iron absorption because iron compete with calcium to be absorbed. And to increase the iron absorption, you need to have vitamin C. But if you have low in vitamin C, it will it will not enhance the iron absorption iron absorption and then cow's milk is very high in protein concentration where it will give stress to the infant's kidney and of course the better choice is breast milk or iron fortified infant formula so infant formula we have three forms ready to feed concentrate the way that where you have to mix it with water uh, or also powder it requires mixing with water so normally what we Sell in Malaysia, we have the powder formula lah, di mana kita bancuh dengan air. So, this is, these are the composition of standard infant formula. We can have a read on it. And these are the special formula, which normally is very expensive. Right? Okay, this is the, what I've mentioned to you. We have the exclusive breastfeeding up to six months class. And then... Uh, after six months, you continue with complementary feeding. Give them um, solid food and also breast milk. And then after they have reached six months, you are, they are ready now to be introduced to solid food. So how do we know that a baby is ready to be um, to be fed? So. We're going to look on this part. So, development of infant feeding skills. These are the cue that show that the baby is ready to be fed. So, you can watch the food being open, watching the food being open in anticipation of eating. So, uh, baby dah mula tengok bila makanan tersebut dibuka ke ataupun dia tengok orang lain makan ke, dia dah start memahati. The baby has start to observe. Kalau masa awal-awal lahir tu tak kisah pun you makan ice cream ke, you buka buka roti, buka plastic roti ke, they will not pay attention but when the baby has start to pay attention by looking at by looking at you, by observing what are you eating, then it is a sign that the baby is ready to be uh, fed with solid food and then tight fist or reaching the spoon baby dah mula untuk capai spoon irritation if feeding is too slow or stops temporarily dia dah uh, dia cepat dia dapat marah kalau kita dah mula start bagi makan dia dah dia dah rasa marah kalau lambat bagi makan and start playing with the food or spoon slowing intake or turning away when full dia dah um um dia dah lari bila rasa kenyang dan sebagainya so ini adalah tanda-tanda yang mesti kita baby dah ready to eat alright okay these are the recommendations that we have in malaysia and also overseas in malaysia we have the rni recommended nutrient intake 
we have now the second version in 2017 and then we also have the Malaysian Dietary Guideline for Children and Adolescents here it is all right and also we have the DRI that reference intake and also we can look also at the overseas guidelines which is the American Academy of Pediatrics so the recommendation for infants are from the dietary reference intake National Academy of Medicine and the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics calorie Berapakah keperluan tenaga? Kalau untuk baby, we suggest them to have about 108 calorie per kilogram per day. So if the baby happen to have, if the, ni tak, tak mungkin lah. Kalau baby tu 1 kilo, berat dia semasa lahir 1 kilogram, tak logik langsung. Ini contoh, baby tersebut perlu makan about 108 calorie. Kalau baby tersebut lahir 2 kilogram kelas, dia kena makan 2 times lah, 108 times by 2 okay, lebih kurang 300 216 calorie kalau 3 kilo you darab by 3 alright so after 6 months uh, penu terdapat penurunan calorie sebanyak 98 calorie so all these are the factors that influence the calorie needs again also same for the protein so for for their birth keperluan protein is about 2.2 gram per kilo per kilogram per day. So katakan baby yang baru lahir um, berat dia 4 kilogram. So baby tersebut perlu ambil 2.2 kilogram kali dengan 4. Sebab untuk 1 kilo sekiranya berat baby 1 kilo dia perlu ambil 2.2 gram of protein. Tapi kalau baby tu berat 4 kilo daraplah dengan 4. Okay macam ni. Dapatlah 8.8 gram protein so baby kena ambil kena kita kena bekalkan se, sebanyak 8.8 gram protein untuk baby tersebut so apabila baby dah masuk 6 bulan ke atas ke 12 bulan keperluan protein dia menurun sebab sebanyak 1.6 gram fat needs there is no specific recommendation for infant ok so breast milk contains about 55% Infant need cholesterol for gonad and brain development. Breast meat contains short chain and medium chain fatty acid in addition to the long chain. It is easier to digest and utilize the long chain fatty acid. So these are the Malaysian dietary guidelines for children. Ada beberapa key message. I'm not mistaken. Ada. Oh, I tak ingat lah. Oh, sorry. So key message one. All right. To practice exclusive breastfeeding sampai 6 bulan. Memang uh, kementerian pun memang dah sarankan untuk exclusive breastfeeding. Maksudnya susu ibu semata-mata sehingga 6 bulan pertama. And continue to breastfeed until 2 years. So start breastfeeding within 1 hour of birth. Breastfeed frequently and on demand. Avoid giving liquids or food other than breast milk until baby are uh, 6 months. So yang kedua, key message yang kedua. Bagilah complementary food daripada 6 bulan hingga 2 bulan yang pertama. Complementary, complementary food ni maksudnya makanan, uh, dah introduce makanan pada 6 bulan dan diteruskan dengan penyusuan susu ibu. Yang seterusnya, give appropriate complementary foods to children between the age of 6 months to 2 years. So, bila dah start boleh bagi makan, bagilah makanan yang sepatutnya, yang bersesuaian. So, these are the uh, suggestion of the uh, appropriate complementary foods ok takkan kita nak bagi coklat takkan kita nak bagi um, uh, apa ni um, you know like uh, uh, junk food so we have to give certain foods that are baby are capable to digest dan sebagainya so ni adalah uh, frekuensi uh, feeding. So kalau baby 6 hingga 8 bulan bagi 2 hingga 3 kali sehari, 9 hingga 11 bulan 3 hingga 4 kali sehari dan seterusnya. Okey, yang warna gelap ni kelas ini adalah energy from breast milk. Ini adalah energy cap. Maksudnya um, kalau you hanya bagi susu ibu semata-mata, berapa banyak yang tak cukup eh? Contohnya Contohnya baby yang pada kosong hingga 2 bulan lahir dia perlukan energi sebanyak 400 500 kalori for example, right? Alright. So 
Jadi dia dapat ditampung oleh susu ibu Sampailah masuk 6 bulan Bila dah masuk 6 bulan Susu ibu hanya boleh bekalkan lebih kurang 400 hingga 500 kalori sahaja sehari So baby sepatutnya perlukan 600 kalori So ada energy gap dekat sini So energy gap ni dia akan ditampungi oleh solid food tadi Sebab tu kita kena introduce solid food Sebab susu ibu dah tak mampu nak menampung uh, keperluan baby pada 6 bulan dan ke atas sama jelah untuk 9 hingga 11 bulan keperluan baby, keperluan tenaga baby dah semakin meningkat. Sekiranya baby sekiranya ibu masih teruskan penyusuan ibu sahaja tanpa uh, diberikan solid food, baby akan kekurangan kalori yang sepatutnya. So all this gap yang berwarna putih perlu ditampungi oleh dia perlu ditampungi dengan solid food. Kalau terlalu introduce awal sangat cusun of the uh, makanan Alright, so dia akan mengambil uh, alih keperluan uh, benefits daripada susu ibu and then increase risk of illness sebab bila dah kurang ke- minum susu ibu, kuranglah antibodies. So ini akan menedahkan kepada all these infections dan uh, food poisoning. Okay, these are the principles of weaning. Bagaimana untuk start baby makan? Kena make sure the baby is free from any disease, terutama gastrointestinal tract punya masalah. Once food is introduced, kalau boleh, uh, kita bagi 4 to 7 days to allow for identification of food allergies and to allow the child to get used of it. Maksudnya, bila pertama kali kita introduce one kind of food, contohnya bubur-bubur, so biarkan kita introduce baby tu makan bubur sampai 4 hari supaya kita boleh check oh tak ada any allergies reaction towards the bubur and then kita boleh follow up by makan telur nak bubur dengan telur so tengok oh dalam 4 hari yang pertama 4 hari kita introduce tak ada any allergies occur so kita tahu baby boleh makan telur so itu antara uh, principles of ini yang kita nak introduce lah nak kita nak maklumkan so kita bagi dalam small amount put the spoon midway back on tongue to facilitate swallowing of semi solid food so cara ni adalah cara approach bagaimana kita nak bagi makan kepada baby lah right jangan bagi makan makanan dalam botol eh elakkan bagi melalui sudu jangan tunggu lama untuk introduce solid food and offer a new food bagi makanan baru bila baby tengah lapar so baby akan nak tak nak dikena makan jugalah so kemudian seterusnya introduce vegetables and non sweeten food first barulah bagi makan makanan yang panis ok ni adalah uh, makanan-makanan yang you perlu introduce dalam masa satu tahun yang pertama so kena avoid bagi salt, sugar, honey or any artificial sweetness kepada baby yang berumur satu tahun ke bawah so for example like honey dia kita boleh bagi kepada um, kanak-kanak berumur satu tahun ke bawah sebab dia ada um, risiko towards botulism my class which is toxin daripada bacteria avoid tea avoid foods that can carry risk of food poisoning and then we also can give finger foods kepada baby Okay, nutrition assessment saya akan ajar pada lecture seterusnya lah. And then these are special concern in infant feed, feeding. So make sure um, baby dah boleh, once baby ada gigi, kena gosok lah to avoid those dental caries. Right? And those vegetarian diet which is low energy, high fiber content, they are no risk towards the baby for 2 to 6 months. But... Um, bila makanan tersebut terlalu tinggi diet, eh sorry, terlalu tinggi fiber, baby akan cepat kenyang. Bila baby cepat kenyang, dia dah tak nak makan uh, makanan lain dah. So, it reduce. Dan also, bila makanan tinggi fiber ni, dia ada tinggi juga kandungan phytate dan certain-certain benda yang boleh inhibit the the absorption of certain vitamins and minerals. And also, it reduce the availability of minerals, vitamin B, iron, calcium and zinc. Plus. Jadi, kolik. Kolik pun saya dah cerita. And then, constipation. Okay. 
These are the possible causes of, for constipation, dietary influences such as inadequate breast milk, infant formula, complementary fluids, foods, fluid intake, improper dilution, early introduction of complementary foods, excessive cow's milk in all, all the infants. All, all these are possible causes for constipation. Right? So these are the intervention. Right? Then you can read what is the intervention for constipation.